Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at Solomon and Perseida. Uh, the tragedy of Solomon and Perseida, uh, wherein is laid open love's constancy, fortune's inconstancy and death's triumphs. Uh, printed first in 1592 and dated a few years earlier and generally attributed to Thomas Kidd uh, because of similarities uh, with some material that uh, features in the Spanish tragedy. Spanish tragedy, a play that we looked at many moons ago, back in the distant days where almost, almost on the, the uh, approaching the before times, we looked at uh, 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 the Spanish tragedy. Uh, and we've also looked at uh, what might be called the Spanish tr comedy, uh, Geronimo, so, uh, or the uh, the uh, first part of the tragedy of Geronimo, uh, comedy of Geronimo. I forget precisely what it's called now. I'm saying this all off the top of my head, so I could all be horribly wrong, which may have a homeopathic connection with a play by Thomas Kidd, uh, but also might not. Uh, so that's all of extant on the uh, YouTube channel. You can uh, go back and have a little look at that. There may be links at the end of this video uh, to find those things. Otherwise, just do a little bit of a search. You'll find it. Uh, so we uh, have this uh, text. We're looking at Act 1 today and uh, we're going to dive into uh, this uh, this uh, semi-historical narrative uh, to look at the text today. Reading uh, Filippo and Haleb today is... That is me, Rachel Nicole, actor in New Jersey, uh, haver of two cats. Uh, reading Death today, a Frenchman, a Spaniard, uh, quite close to each other, and Amarath today is... I am Alan Scott, and for the first bit I'll be talking in capital letters. Uh, reading Piston today is... Uh, Aliki Chapel in Lancaster, actor-translator, uh, owner of one cat and hostess to the other. Uh, reading Erastus, uh, a Turk, and Solomon's Day is... Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu, and I'm an author based in Romford. Uh, reading Perseida, Lucina, and uh, Cyprus today is... Hi, I'm Emma Kemp. Uh, I'm an actor, and I'm in London. Uh, reading A Messenger, Brusor, and Cryer today is... Hello, I'm Helen Good, and I'm wearing this silly hat because I cut my own hair. Ah, the perils of lockdown. It'll all be over soon. Uh, reading Fortune, Englishman, and Ferdinand is... Hi, I'm Eric, and I feel like the beginning of a bad joke. And reading Love and Basilisco is... Hi, I'm Zoe, uh, an actor coming from the south of France. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading uh, occasional stage directions and generally keeping things moving forward. So this, as uh, hinted at by some of the uh, the names uh, and stated earlier, is uh, is a, a Turk play. Uh, we've uh, touched on various texts that have done similar material before. Uh, as ever, we are a, a room of readers, not necessarily uh, a, a matched to any of the parts that we're reading as we try and uh, dive into how this text functions, uh, looking for how uh, it needs to work uh, with uh, real world people in the future. So without further ado, uh, diving into this Solomon and Perseida Act 1, uh, and this is effectively an induction scene featuring the, uh, the real world uh, interpretations of love, fortune and death. So enter love, fortune and death. What? Death and fortune cross the way of love? Um, why, what is love but fortune's tennis ball? Nay, what are you both but subjects under death? And I command you to forbear this place. For here the mouth of sad Melepony is wholly bent to tragedy's discourse. And what are tragedies but acts of death? Here means the wrathful muse in seas of tears and loud laments to tell a dismal tale. Tale wherein she lately hath bestowed the husky humour of her bloody quill. And now for tables takes her to a tongue. Why, thinks death love knows not the history of brave Erastus and his Rhodian dame. Twas I that made their hearts consent to love. And therefore come I now as fittest person 
to serve for chorus to this tragedy. Had I not been, they had not died so soon. Had I not been, they had not died so soon. Uh, nay, that it seems you, you both do miss the mark. Did I not change long love to sudden hate, and then recharge their hatred into love, and then from love deliver them to death? Fortune is chorus, love and death be gone. I tell thee, fortune and thee, wanton love, I will not down to everlasting night till I have moralized this tragedy whose chiefest actor was my sable dart. Nor will I up unto the brightsome sphere from whence I sprang till in the chorus's place I make it known to you and to the world what interest love hath in tragedies. Nay, uh, nay then, though fortune have delighted change, I'll stay my flight and cease to turn my wheel till I have shown by demonstration what interest I have in a tragedy. <sighs> Tush, fortune can do more than love or death. Why stay we then? Let's give the actors leave, and as occasion serves, make our return. And they exuant close of this opening uh, induction first scene depending on what we want to call it so uh we're getting shades of things we've we've seen quite a few times uh, of late um of uh, various uh, uh, f supernatural forces coming on and uh, having a bit of com uh, competition as to who's who's going to who has control of the narrative on some level um we've met fortune quite recently love and fortune uh but we've also had similar things in richard the third uh where uh, uh, uh truth and poetry came on and sort of had a little uh setup of things um so we we've had this quite a few times uh over over the uh, the this time it's also a bit similar to spanish tragedy in the sense that you've got some kind of framing device uh so it's it's uh, quite similar to other uh kiddie things uh alan then eric i just wondering at the top of this uh, page i think there may be a text problem there with the the repeated line the last line of love's speech which is then repeated verbatim by death i don't know whether you you have a different edition to hand that would clarify um it, it 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 there may be some textual issues uh i do believe there are uh, some interesting variations between the various different uh, or the two major editions that uh, that came out, one of which gets adjusted quite soon afterwards. Um, I suspect uh, that that may be or uh, may be an error. It may not. Uh, I think that's one to call on. Uh, do put that kind of thing in the chat, please, uh, so that I remember uh, to look at that in the future. Um, Eric. I was just going to say that it's kind of also like the beginning of, uh, I think it's Musidorus, where we've got like, <laughs> which is a comedy kind of um where we've got the sort of i think it's comedy in war or something if i'm not mistaken i'm just looking up that now uh but yes there's uh that would yeah having 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 some kind of opening prologue where people set up things um uh co yes uh, we've got comedy and envy in Musidorus, yes. Um, coming on and sort of come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a nice way of uh, setting things up. Uh, we've got a nice line. Uh, I think Eric flagged this in the chat of uh, what is love but fortune's tennis ball. Uh, we may hear that echoed later on in future plays further, further down the line. Um, so, yeah, other thoughts? Uh, who are we rooting for? Uh, love, fortune or death? You, you, Death you always comes out on top. <laughs> I'm rooting for fortune. <laughs> I, I love the way that the opening gambit is what what Death and Fortune cross the way of love. It's like they've 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 bumped into each other, and you know this this is my territory. This is my corner. You cannot. You, you you're not supposed to come here, uh, Eric. This is like the idea of like setting this up as a tennis match with someone being the referee. <laughs> Um, it's, it's not quite a game of doubles, though, is it? Um, love, 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 love is playing against two opponents here because it does seem that fortune and death are not exactly on the same side of uh, uh, are, are wandering together. He, he's sitting on a camel, so he's an umpire. And uh, other thoughts from the room? Quickly. <laughs> 
other jokes are available. Um, Unfortunately. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, we've got some rooting for fortune. Uh, expectation of death, they're uh, doing quite well. And, uh, you know, love, love, love. Uh, currently, I don't know if anyone's rooting for love. Uh, well, break, I'm, break. I'll root for love just because it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I always wrote for love. <laughs> uh, Eric. I guess you could also set this up as a sort of scoreboard where you've got the score, like, you know, one point for each or something. Didn't we, didn't we say, yeah, we said something like that for, uh, I think it was Love Great and Fortune points. where we were going, who, who, who's, sco <laughs> who's, do who, uh, who's doing better uh, than the other? And it was a sort of no score draw throughout. So, yeah, maybe we should just keep a note of who's winning each scene and see. It's also uh, we've had before where characters name check these things, uh, whether love, fortune and death get a name check in com upcoming scenes um, uh, con consciously or unconsciously by characters. It'll be interesting. So uh, unless I see additional thoughts, we're going to get into the narrative itself. We've 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 encountered the framing device. Let's go into what we'll call scene one. So uh, enter Erastus and Poseidon. Why then, Poseidon, wilt thou not assure me, but shall I, like a mastless ship at sea, go every way and not the way I would? My love hath lasted from mine infant infancy and still increased as I grew myself. When did Perseida pass time in the street, but her Erastus over eyed her sport? When didst thou, with thy sampler in the sun, sit sewing with thy fears? But I was by, marking thy lily hand's dexterity, comparing it to twenty gracious things. When didst thou, note, thou sing a note that I could hear? But I have framed a ditty to the tune, figuring Perseida twenty kind of ways. When didst thou go to church on holidays? But I have waited on thee to and fro, marking my times as falcons watch their flight. When I have missed thee, how I have lamented, as if my thoughts have been assured true. Thus in my youth, now since I grew a man, I have perse persevered to let thee know the meaning of my true heart's constancy. Then be not nice, Poseidon, as women want to hasty lovers whose fancy is soon fled. My love is of a long continuance and merits not a stranger's recompense. Enough, Erastus. Thy Poseidon knows. She whom thou wouldst have, thine, Erastus, knows. Nay, my Poseidon knows, and then tis well. Ay, what's your vantages? Thine be it then. I have forgot the rest, but that's the effect. Which to effect, except this carcinet. My grandam on her deathbed gave it me, and there, even there, I bowed unto myself to keep the same, until my wandering eye should find a harbour for my heart to dwell. Even in thy breast do I elect my rest. Let in my heart to keep thine company. And, sweet Perseida, accept this ring to equal it. Receive my heart to boot. It is no boot, for that was thine before. And far more welcome is this change to me than sunny days to naked savages, or news of pardon to a wretch condemned that waiteth for the fearful stroke of death. As careful will I be to keep this chain as doth the mother keep her children from water pits or falling in the fire. Over mine armour will I hang this chain, and when long combat makes my body faint, the sight of this shall show Poseidon's name and add fresh courage to my fainting limbs. This day the eager Turk of Tripolis, the knight of Malta, honoured for his worth, and he that's titled by the golden spur, the moor upon his hot barbarian horse, the fiery Spaniard bearing in his face the impress of a noble warrior, the sudden Frenchman and the big-born Dane, and English archers, hardy men-at-arms. I clept lions of the Western world, each one of these approved combatants, assembled from several corners of the world. 
are hither come to try their force in arms in honour of the Prince of Cyprus' nuptials. Amongst these worthies will Erastus' troops through like a gnat among a hive of bees. Know me by this, thy precious carcanet, and if I thrive in valour as the glass that takes the sunbeams burning with his force, I'll be the glass, and thou that heavenly sun, from whence I'll borrow what I do achieve. And, sweet Perseida, unnoted though I be, thy beauty yet shall make me known ere night. Young slips are never graft in windy days. Young scholars never entered with the rod. Oh, my Erastus, these are Europe's knights that carry honour graven in their helms, and they must win it, dear, that win it thence. Let not my beauty prick thee to thy bane. Better sit still than rise and overtame. Counsel me not, for my intent is sworn and be my fortune as my love deserves. So be thy fortune as thy features serve, and then Erastus lives without compare. Enter a messenger. He comes a messenger to haste me to hence. I know your message. Hath the princess sent for me? She hath, and desires you to consult her to the triumphs. Uh, exit the messenger. Very, uh, very commendably short in the message there. Uh, enter Piston. Who saw my master? <clears throat> oh, sir, you here. The prince and all the outlandish gentlemen are, are ready to go to the triumphs. They stay for you. Go, Sirrah. Bid my men bring my horse and a dozen staves. Uh, you shall have your horses and two dozen staves. Exit Piston. Wish me good hap, Perseida, and I'll win such glory as no time shall e'er raise out or end the period of my youth in blood. Such fortune as the good Andromache wished valiant Hector, rounded with the Greeks, I wish Erastus in his maiden wars. Overcome with valour these high-minded knights, as with thy virtue thou hast conquered me. Heavens hear my hearty prayer, and it effect. And exuant, and we'll call that the end of a scene. Uh, so there's some, uh, some, uh, some tourneying going on uh, for the Prince of Cyprus uh, nuptials, and we've got the passing on of a chain. Um, here, have a chain. I will keep the chain. I will talk about uh, things for a long, long time uh, about such things. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah. It's. Uh, I think that chain might be important. Um, it might it might be a thing? Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a nice setup. There's some fighting fighting stuff going on. I'm sure he's, uh, Rastus is going to be very va valiant. Going to be very valiant. I'm sure he's going to be cool. Uh, thoughts in the room uh, about these uh, these this this couple, as it looks to be. Um, Helen. Well, it's nice to find a, a, a lady who doesn't want him to go and risk his life for her. For her mm -hmm. honour. Yeah. Nice. Other thoughts? I quite like Perseida. I think she's really well drawn and I think she's really endearing. Um, just as you said, uh, Helen, she doesn't want uh, Erastus to go fight for her. And I think it just makes her very strong, um, very... She stands out as a female character right from the beginning, and I like that a lot. Uh, Emma, I think. Yeah, just to say that I think this is a very... It's a very lovely kind of love. I think it's very strong. Um, and it's, it feels like for Erastus, this is like the first and only woman that he's ever loved. Because he says, I started loving you when I was a child and I still do now. I still feel like he is pretty young, probably late teens, quite young still. Um, so yeah, it's a strong love, but it's quite a, quite an innocent, quite naive one. Yeah, I think he says that it's his first, you know, this is his first, first proper, proper, uh, you know, uh, uh, fighty things uh, going on. Uh, Aliki. <laughs> Technical uh, terms there. Yeah. 
uh, I was going to say he was very young. It's his maiden fight. She says it as well, um, which I guess, yeah, puts him in his mid to late teens. Um, it's also, I mean, I can't help but notice the play is not called Erastus and <laughs> per se. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I suspect it might not go so well for the young couple. Uh, yes, wherein is laid open love's in, uh, love's constancy, fortune's inconstancy, and death's triumph. So let's see, let's see if that goes well for them. Um, Eric, I was just gonna say I, I like the whole messenger business. It's like, yes, here comes the messenger. Uh, yeah, kind of saying, depending how you play the line, kind of. I had a much longer speech prepared, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but she seemed to know what I was about. Yes, yes. I know your message. Have the, uh, the princess sent for me. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, it's it's not how you should treat messengers. You should say, ah, and then listen to what they have to say. Mm. Not preempt them. Yeah. Um, but you know it's all very efficient. This this stuff. Uh, I like print, uh, Piston as well. You know the prince and all the outlandish gentlemen are ready to go to the triumph. They stay for you. Uh, bring my horse and a dozen staves. I shall have your horses and two dozen of staves. I mean, is that Piston just going trying to remember what he's been asked to get, uh, or is that uh, just uh, for, you know formal formal response? Um... I definitely felt it was snarky. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, whose servant is Piston? Is it his servant or her servant? Because <laughs> that makes a difference. Um, any other thoughts before I ask Eric? I'm just wondering if um, this is going to be added to the horse plays or not. I'm just curious. <laughs> or do we not get that action? Is that like? Will we get it? horses? It's a good question. Uh, we do have a little collection of plays featuring your your genuine horse. Um, I don't know precisely uh, how 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 the the eventing is going to go. So um, fingers crossed, fingers crossed for horses. Uh, Zoe, just uh, was kind of thinking about is is love winning as we sort of talked about this competition and who's winning as we go along. Um, this is the kind of the introduction of a little bit of love to show us how desirable uh, Poseidon and kind of build up the idea of love in there. Oh, can we call scene one love one? Um... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to pull it in with a, quest a provisional question mark. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm, I'm good with that uh, so far. OK, let's go on to what we'll call scene two. Uh, and uh, we have uh, lots of people coming on. Uh, Filippo, uh, Prince of Cyprus, who's currently dub doubling as uh, Poseidon, so don't get confused. Uh, Basilisco and all the knights, all the knights. We've got an Englishman, we've got a Frenchman, we've got a Spaniard. Uh, we've got a chap called Bruzor. Uh, we've got lots of people coming on stage now. Brave knights of Christendom and Turkish both, assembled here in thirsty honors cause to be enrolled in the brass leaved books of never wasting perpetuity. Put lamb like mildness to your lion's strength and be our tilting like two brothers sports that exercise their war with friendly blows. Brave Prince of Cyprus and our son-in-law welcome these worthies by their several countries for in thy honor hither are they come to grace thy nuptials with their deeds at arms. First, welcome, thrice renowned Englishmen, graced by thy country, but 10 times more by thy approved valor in the field. Upon the onset of the enemy, what is thy motto when thou spurst thy horse? In Scotland uh, was I made a knight at arms, where for my country's cause I charged my lance. In France, I took the standard from the king and gave the flower of Gallia in my crest against the light foot Irish have I served, and in my skin bear tokens of their curtains. One word of courage all the world hath heard. St. George for England, and St. George for me. Like welcome unto thee, fair knight of France. Well famed thou art for discipline in war. Upon the encounter of thine enemy, what is thy mot, renowned knight of France? In Italy I put my knighthood on, 
were in my shirt, but with a single rapier, I combated a Roman much renowned. His weapons point in poison for my bane, and yet my stars did bode my victory. Saint Denis is for France, and that for me. Welcome, Castilian too, among the rest. For fame dost thou my valour with the best. Upon the first encounter of thy foe, what is thy word of courage, brave man of Spain? At fourteen years of age I was made knight, when twenty thousand Spaniards were in field, what time a daring rutter made a challenge to change a bullet with our swift flight shot, and I, with single heed and level hit, the haughty challenger, and struck him dead. The golden fleece is that we cry upon, and Jacques, Jacques, is the Spaniard's choice. Next, welcome unto thee, renowned Turk, not for thy lay, but for thy worth in arms. Upon the first brave of thine enemy, what is thy noted word of charge, brave Turk? Against the Sophie, in three pictured fields under the conduct of great Solomon have I been chief commander of an host and put the flint heart Persians to the sword. In desert plains of Africa have I stained with blood of Moors and there in three set battles fought, marched conqueror through Asia, along the coasts held by the Portuguese, even to the verge of gold aboarding Spain hath Brusso led a valiant troop of Turks and made some Christians kneel to Mahomet. Him we adore, and in his name I cry, Mahomet for me and Solomon. Now, Signor Basilisco, you we know, and therefore give you not a stranger's welcome, you are a rutter born in Germany. Upon the first encounter of your foe, what is your brave upon the enemy? I fight not with my tongue. This is my oratrix. And lays his hand upon his sword. Why, Signor Basilisco? Is it a she-sword? Aye, and so are all blades with me. Behold my instance. Per day, each female is the weaker vessel, and the vigour of this arm infringeth. The temper of any blade, quoth my assertion, and thereby gather that this blade, being approved weaker than this limb, may very well bear a feminine epitheton. Tis well proved. But what's the word that glories your country? Sith to say, the earth is my country. As the air to the fowl or the marine moisture to the red gilled fish, I repute, repute myself no coward. For humility shall mount, I keep no table, to character my four past conflicts. As I remember, there happened a sore drought in some parts of Belgia, that the gr juicy grass was seared with the sun god's element. I held it policy to put the men children of that climate to the sword, that the mother's tears might relieve the parched earth. The men died, the women wept, and the grass grew. Else had my Friesland horse perished, whose loss would have more grieved me than the ruin of that whole country. Upon a time in Ireland I fought, on horseback with a hundred cans, from Titan's eastern uprise to his western downfall, insomuch that my steed began to faint. I, conjecturing the cause to be want of water, dismounted, in which place there was no such element. Enraged, therefore, I with this scimitar, all on foot like a Herculean offspring, endured some three or four hours' combat, in which process my body distilled such dewy showers of sweat that from the warlike wrinkles of my front my palfrey cooled his thirst. My mercy in conquest is equal with my manhood in fight, the tear of an infant hath been the ransom of a conquered city, whereby I purchased the surname of Pity's Adamant. Rough words blow my collar as the wind of Mulciba's workhouse. I have no word, because no country. 
Each place is my habitation. Therefore, each country's word mine to pronounce. Princes, what would you? I have seen much, heard more, but done most. To be brief, he that will try me, left him waft me with his arm. I am for him for some five lances. Although it go against my stars to jest, yet to gratulate this benign prince, I will suppress my condition. He is beholding to you greatly, sir. Mount, yea, brave Lord Links. Four words to the tilt. Myself will censure of your chivalry, and with impartial eyes behold your deeds. Forward, brave ladies, place you to behold the fair demeanour of these warlike knights. And they all exit apart from Basilisco. I am melancholy. The humour of Venus belagarus me. I have rejected with contemptible frowns the sweet glances of many amorous girls, or rather ladies. But set is, I am now captivated with the reflecting eye of that admirable comet, Perseida. I will place her to behold my triumphs and do wonders in her sight. Oh heavens, she comes accompanied with a child whose chin bears no impression of manhood, not a hair, not an excrement. And we'll pause there. Um, uh, so, yes, we've got it's a it's a you know, we've got uh, fighty stuff's going on and we've got uh, all these people there fighting for the entertainment of Cyprus on his nuptials. And so we've got an Englishman to do some token Englishman th speech, Frenchman, token Frenchman speech, Spaniard, token Spaniard speech. And then we get characters who have names, Bruzor and Basilisco, to do different kind of business. And uh, and so the, but that setup is, I think, important to set up sort of the conventions, the things you expect people to say. Um, and we come to Basilisco last and... Uh, is someone who wants to make an impression, not with words, or at least not initially, but with, with, you know, I find not with my tongue, this is my oratrix, and pulls his sword, um, uh, which leads to interesting uh, um, speechifying uh, questions and, uh, and thoughts. Um, let's see what the room thinks. Uh, how how are we finding? Uh, I think the the, the characters who c count here um, of uh, of Basilisco first. Let's start with Basilisco. Who uh, thoughts from the room on on this uh, this personage, a rutter born in Germany, Helen? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I put in the chat. He's a sort of Baron von Munchausen. I mean, he he. One can believe that he has fought in various different parts, but. The whole idea that Frisian babies were killed so that their mother's tears would enable the grass to grow. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, he is way over the top. Mm. He's trying a bit too hard, isn't he? <laughs> <sighs> Is is there is there a, a question of, uh, you know, it's also just occasional really interesting word choices as well. Hmm. Uh, Rachel. No, um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if it's like that thing in, um, this isn't from the period, but, you know, uh, Sleepy Hollow, that, uh, that short story, um, there's a part where he says, uh, about people who were in war and they come back with their stories and somehow they're so overblown I wonder if just because of the length of this monologue and uh, Basilisco seems so poetic in what he's saying um, and what he's saying is so over the top, if it's um, not what you guys call a shaggy dog story, but just a story of overblown glory. Yeah, there's a general rule of thumb that if you talk uh, at length about a, a battle you were in, you weren't there, or you didn't do anything. Um, it's it's a general rule of thumb. People who are actually in the thick of it don't talk about it um, very much. So there there is that sort of element. Uh, you might give a CV uh, list of your accomplishments, uh, uh, and you sort of compare with what the others were saying. 
I've I've been to here. I've been to there. I've done some stuff. Um, here is my patron saint. Um, you know, and it's relatively formal. Um, whereas this is uh, is is quite different. And Brusor, to a degree, uh, is is giving a slightly different. So there's a sort of progression in the scene of characters who who do slightly different things. Uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention that it's interesting how none of them really mention religion until Bruce Um He's the only one who mentions, like, you know, the sort of um, Mahomet and Christians and stuff. Well, I mean, I, obviously, Cyprus says, uh, you know, brave knights of Christendom and Turkish too, but it's like, it, it just seems interesting as a choice <laughs> to have, like, basically four, you know, or however many knights who are. Christian and then one who's Turkish or at least not, you know, not um, Christian. Well, they do a bit because they the each of them says their their national patron saint as they go along. Uh, so it might be a case of if the Englishman goes Saint George, you know, Saint Denis, uh, etc. That actually he the, this character feels the need to actually really state that at the end. Uh, in a slightly more forceful way, I'm just going. I I, I I'm outside of this, uh, and this is uh, very much our mission statement here. Uh, you know, I can make people like them kneel before me, um, and uh, that's that's a, that's a very different uh, direction. Uh, any other thoughts on that, or other things in this this relatively formal section? As I say, you know, this is a public th spectacle going on here. This isn't a private conversation, Helen. This is a massive joust of international proportions. I mean, jousting was an extremely expensive, extremely dangerous elite sport in which you showed your value to your country and to your countrymen. Um, and er Erastus, is that his name? Erastus, yes, is completely outclassed. Mm. Especially if he's fairly young, because he needs weight and experience. He needs to be well into his twenties to carry to 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 break a lance properly against any of these people. Mm. Um, uh, Aliki. Yeah, that's that's what Perseida was was telling him. This is the Olympics. This mm. is what this is. And, and he's like, oh, I've just got my red belt. I'm going to go into Olympic karate. <laughs> yeah, and even a braggart like Basilisco, his last lines there is she comes accompanied with a child whose chin bears no impression of manhood, <laughs> not a hair, um, uh, not an excrement. I, I don't know whether there's a, there's a deliberate language barrier element to some of his words where he's getting the wrong word or whether there's something I'm missing there or whether there's just a typo I don't know lots of interesting questions about that as a line um, but he's not impressed uh, and that's coming from Basilisco as well who we've already established is not necessarily uh, the top notch draw that he sells himself as uh, Rachel then Eric um, no just the just the sports first we have tennis and then we have um we have uh this jousting um and i wonder if you know because it's so it's so recreational and it's so um i know i know we we don't joust now but i'm wondering like was jousting then like because there's so much romance there is it just is it just supposed to be this thing like that's so romantic, like Basilisco is, you know, he, he's there for the glory, but I think he's also there for women and he's there for, you know, um, you know, picking somebody up. Uh, so I feel like there's some there's some lightheartedness in this in this play through the emphasis of, of these, you know, recreational sports that, um, you know, aristocracy would be you know taking part in and not your average person some sort of like i don't want to say like old school romance but i, I, I don't know because of the names and that, it makes me feel like it has it has it has like a a slightly before the period this was written type of feel to it 
Uh, yeah, there's a, 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 absolutely yes. There's there's something very sleazy about Bertolisco. You're right. He does feel like he's doing this to pick up <laughs> pick up uh, uh, people. I mean, the way he says amorous girls or rather ladies, like he's <laughs> he's going. No, that's the better way of selling this concept, isn't it? Yes. Um, and he's just going. Mm, yeah. Ooh. Eric then Helen. I was just going to point out that I, we don't really know where this is taking place, sort of, I mean, geographically speaking, because like, um, yeah, it's just they're from all over the place and they meet. They must be meeting somewhere in neutral, presumably Cyprus, but then like Cyprus was under conquest, <laughs> literally, and uh, at this point in time, historically. Well, the, the, the period of the play is around 1520s, uh, 1522-ish. Uh, that's sort of the area where it is. Uh, that's why it's in this sort of area of history, um, though precisely how much the play actually engages with that is uh, is an interesting question. So it's set, in a sense, 70-odd uh, years earlier than uh, the play is written. Uh, Helen? Uh, yes, I think it's a mistake to think that jousting is medieval. Jousting was very, very current. Um, at the time when this play was written, the annual, well, the various uh, annual jousts were, they were very, very important for the ceremonial, for the court, for the military commanders. Um, it, it, it was about manhood um, in, the, uh, in the elite circles. And it, it was it was not all right. They may talk a lot about Arthur and Guinevere and all sorts of other strange things because there were little pageants that went with the various jousters. But nevertheless, it was it was very much of the day, not a historical thing. Excellent. Well, we're still mid-scene, so let's uh, let's gather some more data. Uh, Basilisco is on. He has noted the arrival of Perseda, uh, Perseda, and uh, so enter Erastus, the uh, young boy uh, who bears no impression of manhood, and Perseda, and Piston as well. My sweet Perseda! Peace, infant, thou blasphemer! Right. Exuant Erastus and Poseidon, so presumably that was a bit of a drive-by wandering by them. Uh, but Piston remains to talk to Basilisco. You're deceived, sir. He swore not. I tell thee, Jester, he did worse. He called that lady his. Jester! <laughs> oh, extempore! Oh, flores! Oh, harsh, uneducate, illiterate peasant, thou abusest the phrase of the Latin. By God's fish, friend, take you the Latin's part, I'll abuse you too. What stands dread of our indignation? Sanse? What language is that? I think thou art a word maker by thy occupation. Aye, termest thou me of an occupation? Nay, then, this fiery humour of cholera is suppressed by the thought of love, fair lady. Now, by my troth, she's gone. I <laughs> had the infant transported her hence. He saw my anger figured in my brow, and at his best advantage stole away. But I will follow for revenge. Uh, uh, nay, but hear you, sir. I must talk with you before you go. And Piston gets on his back and pulls him down. Oh, if, if, if thou beast magnanimous, come before me. Nay, if thou beest a right warrior, get from under me. What wouldst thou have me at? Typhoon or bear a pelion or osa? Typhon me no typhons, but swear upon my dungeon dagger not to go till I give thee leave. But stay with me and look upon the tilters. Oh, thou seekest thereby to dim my glory. I care not for that. Wilt thou not swear? Oh, I, I swear, I swear. He sweareth him on his dagger. By the contents of this blade. By the contents of this blade. I, the aforesaid Basilisco. I, the aforesaid Basilisco. Knight, good fellow, knight, knight. Knave, good fellow, knave, knave. Will not offer to go from the side of Piston. Will not offer to go from the side of Piston. Without the leave of the said Piston obtained. Without the leave of the said Piston, licensed, obtained and granted. Enjoy thy life and live, I give it thee. I enjoy my life at thy hands, I confess it. 
I am up, but that I am religious in mine oath. Well, what would you do, sir? What would you do? Will you up the ladder, sir, and see the tilting? Then they go up the ladders and they sound within to the first course. Better a dog fawn on me than bark. Now, sir, how likes thou this course? Oh, the, the, their lances were couched too high and, and their steeds ill-born. Maybe so, it may be so. <laughs> sound to the second course. I'm assuming it's some kind of trumpeting, sound effects of horses' hooves. I don't know. Get the coconuts out. Now, sir, how like you this horn, this course? Pretty, pretty, but, but, but not famous. Well, for a learner, but not for a warrior. By my faith, me thought it was excellent. Aye, in the eye of an infant, a peacock's tail is glorious. <laughs> Sound of the second course. Oh, well, run the bay horse with the blue tail. And the silver knight are both down. Oh, by cock and pie and mouse foot, the Englishman is a fine knight. Now, by the marble face of the welkin, he is a brave warrior. What oath is there? Fie upon the extortioner! Huh? Now comes in the infant that courts my mistress. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that my lance were in my rest and my beaver closed for this encounter. Oh, well run! My master hath overthrown that Turk! Now, oh, to fie upon the Turk to be dismounted by a child, it, it vexes me. Sound to the fifth course. Oh, well run, Master! You've overthrown the Frenchman! It, it is the fury of his horse, not, not the strength of his arm. I would thou wouldst remit my oath that I might assail thy master. I give thee leave, go to my destruction. But, Sarah, where's thy horse? Why, my, my, my page stands holding him by the bridle. Well, go, mount thee, go. I go and fortune guide my lance. Exit Basilisco. Take the brangiest knave in Christendom with me. Oh, truly, I'm sorry for him. Just like a knight, he'll just like a jade. It is a world to hear the fool braid and brag. He will jet as if it were a goose on a green. He goes many times supperless to bed, and yet he takes physic to make him lean. Last night he was bidden to a gentlewoman's to supper, and because he would not be put to carve, he wore his hand in a scarf and said he was wounded. <laughs> he, he wears a coloured lathe in his scabbard, and when it was found upon him, he said he was wrathful. He might not wear iron. He wears civet. And when it was asked him where he had that must, he said all his kindred smelled so. <laughs> Is that this count a counterfeit fool? Well, I'll up and see how he speeds. So assuming he goes back up the ladders to watch, and we have the sound of the sixth course. <laughs> Squire, he's a very feigned knight. Why, my master has overthrown him and his girdle both to the ground. <laughs> I shall have old laughing. <laughs> it would be better than the fox in the hole for me. <laughs> and there will pause at what's possibly the end of what we might call the scene, whether we call that the end of an action. I don't know whether Piston is still on stage or not. Uh, but we'll pause there because I think this Piston Basilisco material is rather fun. Um, we've got, yeah, uh, just simply Basilisco just just um, shouting an insult at Erastus. Um, my sweet Persida, uh, Persida and his, what's the objection? He called that lady his. How dare he, the young upstart. And uh, Piston puts him in his place by climbing on his back and forcing him to swear. <laughs> <laughs> on his dagger um yeah it's um it's really nicely silly i'm rather enjoying this uh thoughts on the room um 
because there's all sorts of interesting staging questions uh, about going up the ladders. I mean, is how 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 that functions? I mean, effectively, it's standing on the box to see over the fence kind of thing, isn't it? Um, but how that is actually set up on stage is an interesting question. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a leaky then, Eric. Well, it does spare you having to do anything much about the horses other than doo -doo 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 -doo, if they've both got their backs to the audience and they're going, oh, look at that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're all of the, the cast backstage. To, you know, you you've got the coconuts, you've got the thing, and then they go, "Ooh!" <laughs> I'm really liking that. It's brilliant. It also makes me think that Piston must be a little boy, because I had I had him in my head as a sort of middle aged um, kind of I have been raising this young knight since he was two retainer. But the excitement and the oh my master suddenly i had an image of him as a as a boy especially a boy who had climbed up on the top of um basilisco kind of like andre the giant and um the dread pirate roberts that kind of fight you know mm. very small per light person on top of a big one <laughs> Yeah, and that this is it makes it even funnier the fact that Basiliska can't do anything about it. It's just it's just can't get him off, can't get him off, can't shake him. And this great warrior uh, yeah. is bested by a small child is uh, would work really well. Um, and the fact that Piston clearly has his number and you know everybody knows who this guy is uh, on the circuit or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's um, uh, yeah, it it's really dynamic. It's really fun. It solves that problem. We've we've got other plays from around now where you've got these thi this impression that big battles and things are happening just off stage, and that uh, you get that in Tamburlaine where they're basically sitting down having tea uh, while the battle scene occurs, and just sort of uh, noting what uh, what what does that what does that trumpet sound mean, um, rather than actually having to do it. Um, uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I like this exchange in the whole, like, um, you know, swearing by the blade thing. And that, that that was like, well, that's quite a reversal. Like, usually it's the other way around. The, the It's the, how do you call it? Um, the, the serious character who says something and then it's like repeated wrongly by the clown um, kind of thing. But then obviously in this case, it's not not the same. Yeah, Basilisco is, um, uh, has, has, um, alterations to the terms and conditions of the uh, of the the swearing you know he's he's got footnotes um that he's 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 going to object you know he's, i love the whole thing of night good fellow night night uh <laughs> get the get the terms of address right <laughs> other thoughts uh eric again and then alan uh, uh, there's a very sort of uh, i think it's um Monty Python and the Holy Grail, <laughs> that kind of feel to this, uh, where it's like, you know, uh, the minstrel walking behind um, Sir Robin or whatever his name is going, and brave Sir Robin ran, brave Sir Robin ran, or whatever the song is, sort of talking about how he was actually, instead of running towards danger, he runs away from danger and just is cowardly. It has that kind of feel to it. Mm. And yeah, and yet we we have framed uh, with you know what's in theory a very serious you know that these these events uh, do bring in comedy characters as well as very serious fighters and you know these fights are probably quite exciting, especially for a, a boy who wants to watch fights and then it's his master's fight or uh, uh, that that he's interested in as well and then also what this comedy semi comic character is doing. Uh, Alan then Helen. I must admit I'm just wondering whether Basilisco is actually the clown role. Oh, very possibly. From, from, yes. from, from his totally OTT speeches. Mm. Uh, though, as, as ever, we have to be a bit careful about the designation of the clown role uh, because, of course, uh, uh, people can mm. uh, play multiple roles. Uh, even if you have a speciality, uh, there may be more room for manoeuvre on that term. Uh, Helen? Yeah, the, the, rather than Monty Python, there's a film, I think it's called The Knight's Tale. Yeah, Heath Ledger. Um, yeah, Keith Le Heath Ledger, that's right. Yeah, and exactly. that that shows some of the, the dangers and the problems and the and the rules of joust, the joust. I mean it's it's set nominally set in some weird medieval fantasy world. Um earlier than this, but nevertheless it is quite good on the basics of jousting. I mean they've got that right. 
It's uh, funny that you say that, Helen, because that's what I was thinking the whole way through. I've been thinking of A Night's Tale. I thought, well, it's a bit modern. They, they added a modern twist to it in the uh, in the film. So I wasn't sure how close that jousting is to the real joust, like Henry VIII very, jousted. Very close. It, it, well, it's got, it's got the right rules and the right theories. Oh, okay. Cool. Um... Yeah, it's 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 also interesting actually about uh, uh, modern 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 film interpretations of things about uh, um, you know the the things that they do get assiduously right and the things that they they they, they play around with and sometimes it's that kind of detail where you you uh, the, uh, people really really get into uh, the the logistics of things. Uh, so we've reached a certain point. Uh, effectively, this is a continuation of the scene. I don't know whether we count it as a the the same scene or not, uh, and whether no, different I... editions do. Um, if uh, if Piston is, remains on stage, then it does. If if he doesn't, then it it, it doesn't. Uh, so we... I think there's a, I think there's about another page to the end of the scene. Mm. He's got an entrance line in a page and a half or so. So yeah, but there is an exuant pri prior to that. So uh -huh, um, okay. it, it it he might exit later. So you might consider this a uh, continuous unit. Um, effectively, it sort of is. I don't think there's any time difference between the previous section and this section. Um, uh, I say uh, there's a bit more textual research to do on the different editions of this text. Uh, anyway, uh, we have a sounding uh, of some, uh, presumably to say all's over. Enter Filippo, Prince of Cyr uh, Cyprus, Erastus, Ferdinando, Lucina, uh, Lucina and all the knights. Brave gentlemen, by all your free consent, this knight unknown hath best demean himself. According to the proclamation made, the prize and honour of the day is his. But now, unmask thyself that we may see what warlike wrinkles time hath charactered with age's print upon thy warlike face. <laughs> According to his request, brave man at arms, and let me see the face that hath vanquished me. Mask thyself, thy well approved knight. Is this I'm me? Uh, yeah, I, I gave was... I gave it to Elizabeth, um, oh. but it might actually be um, it might actually be uh, your character, uh, Elizabeth, for the moment. I long to see thy face, brave warrior. Hey, valiant sir, we may not be denied if fair ladies should be coy to show their faces, unless that the sun should tan them with his beams. I'll be your page this once, but to disarm you. Uh, piston. Uh, that's the reason that he shall help your husband to arm his head. Oh, the policy of this age is wonderful. What? Young Erastus, is it possible? Erastus, be thou honoured for this deed. So young and of such good accomplishment, thrive, fair beginner, as this time doth promise, in virtue, valour, and all worthiness. Give me thy hand, I vow myself thy friend. Thanks, worthy sir, whose favourable hand hath entered such a youngling in the war, and thanks unto you all, brave worthy sirs, impose me task, how I may do you good, Erastus will be dutiful in all. Leave protestations now, and let us hie, to tread Lavolto, this is woman's walk. There spend we the remainder of the day. And exit everyone apart from Ferdinando. Overborn and foiled in my course, yet have I partners in mine infamy. Tis wondrous that such that so young a toward warrior should bide the shock of such approved knights, as he this day hath matched and mated too. But virtue should not envy good desert. Therefore, Erastus, happy lord thy fortune. But my Lucina, how she hath changed her colour when at encounter i did lose a stirrup hanging her head as partner of my shame therefore now will i go visit her and please her with this carcanet of worth which by good fortune i have found today what when valor fails then must gold make the way and exit ferdinando and it's interesting this character the him and lucina have been sort of introduced sideways into the the narrative here uh we haven't really encountered them they might have been on stage earlier um, 
But yeah, he's uh, he's not done as well as he was hoping. He's not keen on Erastus. I wonder if that's going to lead to some bad things later on. Um, and his love is uh, is less keen, perhaps. And so he's going to present lots of gold. That'll be that'll that'll turn his fortunes. If um, but the word fortune. So is this fortune one? Um, love one, fortune one. Um, for 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 these first two scenes here. I'm saying that's the end of the scene as well. I think this is all one continuous unit until here. Um. Other thoughts? Aliki? Well, I mean, it's not just gold, is it? It's a sarsenet or a carcinet. I don't know which. Um, and in any case, which he just happened to find. And haven't we recently seen one of those given as a love token? Mm. Mm. <laughs> has, has uh, well, you know, has either Erastus dropped it and he's just picked it up? Um what was was that one of um, Piston's job that he, he should have been doing, but he was too busy watching the fight? I I you know I'm not I'm not going to try and push push blame onto a servant, but um, um, you know whose whose fault is that? And yes, if it is the same the same chain, um, then uh, uh, then uh, yeah, that could be bad. That could lead to bad things. Uh, other thoughts, uh, Rachel. Um. How, uh, Ferdinando, what you just said, um, you know, bring brings up Erastus's fortune. I wonder if uh, each, you know, I wonder who's the champion of death and who's the champion of fortune and, you know, love. Who they've taken the side, who these um, concepts have taken the side of in this jousting tournament to. Uh, it, it's kind of like um, that the Lily play that we just did with um, Pandora, um, where all the gods have their turn, and who are who are they possessing in this, and who side are they taking in this game and having fun with? You know, like they're having fun with um, you know these mortal people and using them in their little game. Well, yeah, because Erastus's fortune is up in terms of the day, because everyone goes, "Oh, what what strong, uh, uh, experienced knight is this guy?" Lifts up visor. Oh no, he's quite young. Oh, well done, well done. I want to be your friend. Um, yeah. But he's lost the chain, if it is the chain that he was given. Uh, so that's fortunes doing all sorts of interesting up and downy things. But yeah, is Ferdinando is he death's champion? Because he, he he is sort of talking in in you know he's not quite on I'll get you gadget, um, but he's 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 you know a hop skip and a jump away from it isn't he? Um, so yeah, uh, interesting question. I like the idea that yeah the uh, these 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 allegorical figures wander around, touching people on shoulders, going yes you are mine you are mine. Um, you know, it gives the actors playing them something to do if they are actually cast uh, as uh, and not doubled with other people. Uh, other thoughts, Eric. I guess it's interesting because, like, you know, you kind of think at the beginning when when uh, Basilisco appears, you think that you know maybe this is going to be the sort of antagonist, and then you for out of nowhere you get for not for Denando, who's kind of you know just very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it, and it's, as I say, it's an interesting sideways way of introducing the character as well. Like, I, 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 it's an interesting uh, way of doing it. I quite like it because uh, he should have been visible and about, even if he hasn't said anything or been introduced properly. So it's 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 nice. Um, I hope it works. Um, maybe it doesn't, I, Eric. I guess also because like we've been told this is a tragedy, so it's kind of like you know at some point the sort of anxiety violence cue in. Uh, but like very, very slowly, and you're getting this creeping sense that it's going to get worse and worse. Maybe I don't know. Mm. Unless, of course, where because we've already had that question about whether Bruiser is uh, the same as uh, who's listed in this scene as just Turk, whether Ferdinando is actually the Spaniard or similar that we had earlier. Um, so it might be that he hasn't been introduced. It's just simply we've read it as him being introduced here. Um, so that might be a textual question whether it just hasn't been named at that point. Um, I think that's very likely. Mm. Yeah, it's possible because the Spaniard doesn't reappear in that, but all the other knights do. Yeah, it uh, reduces the numbers. We'd have to double this down, which makes me happy. Um, 
<laughs> but it'd be nice if the playwright had, uh, or the printer had, uh, had done it tidily to start with. But never mind. What can you do? Uh, other thoughts before we go on to what we'll call the uh, scene three? Um, no. Okay. It's 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 bouncing along. There's there there are uh, obviously um, the world that they're building here is uh, ha has lots of layers to it, which is nice. Um, Elements are not unproblematic, of course, in terms of the way these characters are, are re referring to each other and the politics that's going on in that, though at this stage, whether that's a sort of fundamental play world issue or play right issue is a, is a, a thing we'll discuss uh, towards the end of the week, I suspect. Uh, anyway, we'll call this scene three and it's the return of Basilisco. Basilisco and ch three cheers, everyone. He's riding... Riding of a mule. So this gets. Oh, there we are. cursed fortune, enemy to fame, thus to disgrace thy honored name by overthrowing him that far hath spread thy praise beyond the course of Titan's burning rays. Enter piston. Page, set aside the gesture of my en my enemy. Give him a fiddler's fee and send him packing. Oh, God save you, sir. Have you bust your chin? I, villain, I have broken my shin bone, my backbone, my channel bone, and my thigh bone, besides two dozen of small inferior bones. A shrewd loss, by my faith, sir. Where's your courser's tail? He lost the same in service. <laughs> there was a hard piece of service where he lost his tail. But how chance did his nose is slit? For presumption for covering the Emperor's mare. Marry a foul fault. Why are his ears cut? For neighing in the Emperor's court. Why then, thy horse has been a colt in his time. True, thou hast said. Oh, touch not the cheek of my palfrey, lest he dismount me while my wounds are green. Page, run, bid the surgeon bring his incision. Y yet stay, if, uh, I'll ride along with thee myself. And exit uh, Basilisco. I'm just going to pause here, just saying we really need to phone the RSPCA here. Um, <laughs> this, this, this mule. Uh, has tail cut, nose slit um, yeah. uh, for... Um, for for uh, uh, sex out of uh, wedlock, presumably. I didn't know that applied to horses. Um, and, um, and and having his ears cut. I mean, oh, there's horrible things happening to this horse. Or well, this, uh, yeah, mule. Um, uh, which, you know, following Basilisco just entering being, oh, I, I obviously having really done badly in the fight and is, is just covered in bruises and things and probably mugging for all he's worth. I think let's bring him on on crutches and just uh, and a collar and, 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 and leave it at that. I, 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 I don't want to do this to a horse. I'm sorry. It's extreme, isn't it? Yeah. It's extreme. For a bit of word thing stuff. Uh, Helen. Yes. Is it in fact not? what we're thinking is it in fact not a mule as it says and the diff it's the difference between the mule and the horse that he's pointing out i think so too so he's pretending that it's an, a horse that's had a hard life yeah. but in oh. fact it's a mule that hasn't excellent that makes I, me happier <laughs> yeah well i think that may be what we're talking about here that's how well, i read it too so all the things that have happened to the horse are actually the things that make it a mule. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Excellent. I'm glad I brought all that up in excessive detail um, <laughs> because uh, uh, that, that's that's what we're here to do. Um, I mean, I don't say that is it, but that is how I read it. Yeah, no, that works. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Aliki. Yeah, no, it's just, you know, like somebody comes in on a battered bicycle and you say, you're Rolls Royce. What happened to its two other wheels? <laughs> <laughs> that makes this funny and therefore me happy. Um, OK, excellent. Right. Well, with that, that's that's got to the, uh, the meat of that. Um, riding mule, not a horse. Lovely. Um, excellent. 
So, a mockery of Basilisco continues. Uh, Piston says he's going to bear you company, uh, in, and uh, but uh, is is going to be interrupted. So, uh, Piston, can you say you're going to bear him company, please? And I'll bear you company. Piston getteth up on his ass and rideth him with him to the door, and meeteth the crier. Enter the crier. Come, sirrah. Let me see how finely you'll cry this chain. Why? What was it worth? It was worth more than thou and all thy kin are worth. Why, well, maybe so. But what must he have that finds it? Why, a hundred crowns. Why then, I'll have ten for the crying of it. Ten crowns? We had but a sixpence for crying a little wench of thirty years old and upward that had lost herself betwixt a tavern and a body house. Aye, that was a wench. This is gold. She was poor, but this is rich. <laughs> well, why then, by this reckoning, a hackneyman should have ten shillings for horsing a gentlewoman, where he hath but ten pence of a beggar. Why, in reason good, let them pay the best may. As the lawyers use their rich clients when they let the poor go under former pauperous. <laughs> Why then, I pray thee, cry the chain for me sub forma pauperis. For money goes very low with me at this time. Aye, sir, but your master is, though you be not. Aye, but he must not know that thou criest the chain for me. I do but use thee to save me a labour that am to make inquiry after it. Well, sir, you'll see me considered, will you not? I marry, will I? Why, what lighter payment can there be than consideration? <laughs> oh, yay! And enter Erastus. How now, Sirrah? What are you crying? A oh, chain, sir. A chain. That your man bade me cry. Get you away, Sirrah. I advise you, meddle with no chains of mine. Exit the crier. You paltry knave, how durst thou be so bold to cry the chain when I bid thou shouldst not? Did I not bid thee only underhand make privy inquiry for it through the town, lest public rumour might have advertised her, whose knowledge were to me a second death? Why would you have me run up and down the town? My shoes are done. What you want in shoes, I'll give you in blows. And beats him. I pray you, sir, hold your hands. And as I am an honest man, I'll do the best I can to find your chain. And exit piston. Ah, treacherous fortune. Enemy to love. Didst thou advance me for my greater fall? In dallying war, I lost my chiefest peace. In hunting after prey, I lost my love. And in love's shipwreck will my life miscarry. Take thou the honour and give me the chain, wherein was linked the sum of my delight. When she delivered me the carcanet, keep it, quoth she, as thou wouldst keep myself. I kept it not. And therefore she is lost. And lost with her is all my happiness. And loss of happiness is worse than death. Come, therefore, gentle death, and ease my grief. Cut short what malice fortune misintends. But stay a while, good death, and let me live. Time may restore what fortune took from me. Ah, oh, no! Wait, losses are seldom are restored. What? If my chain shall never be restored, my innocence shall clear my negligence. Ah, oh, but my love is ceremonious and looks for justice at her lover's hand within forced furrows of her clouding brow. As storms that fall amid a sunshine day, I read her just desires and my decay. And exit end scene. Uh, yeah, um, Erastus has definitely lost the chain. Uh, more importantly, he's trying to make sure that it's found without telling anyone. So what does his servant do? Hires a crier. 
who then tries to negotiate the value of his services uh, in a way that's really quite fun. Um, and uh, and Kristen says, don't tell my master. Master enters, immediately tells his master. Uh... <laughs> um, yeah, so thoughts on the room, Helen? Uh, Informa pauperis is a sort of not quite legal aid, but a, a similar version of it. And it, 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 it could be, it could even be used in taking cases to, to Star Chamber. I mean, there weren't many in form of Papyrus, but the, the, there were some. You, you, by being established that you were a pauper, your, your litigation cost you a lot less. Uh, yeah, Elizabeth. Oh, I was just asking about this chain because I envisioned this chain of office, like, you know what mayors wear? But I don't think it's that kind of chain. I think it's like a small one. Yeah. What do we think? Yeah, it seems to be. It's more a love token than a than an official thing, isn't it? Um, okay. Uh, Eric, were you waving? That's what I was going to say. Um, that is probably like a sort of I don't know lock a locket or something. Um, or uh, yeah. It can't be too big because uh, she'd probably notice if it wasn't there. If it's something that can be worn, say, underneath the uh, the 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 day to day wear, um, then that that may work. Um, uh, Rachel, are you waving? No, just um, I, I uh, Rastus's last um, speech there. I, I I was going. I started going back up to the play um, because. He starts rhyming here, and he it, it the you know we don't have a lot of a rhyme a lot of rhyme scheme here, it um and then he starts to as he's going into this lament he starts to get very um poetic so I don't know if um I don't know what that's what what the writer in, intended um in doing that is it a parody of other um you know plays that you know, you know are over the the top in their language it, or it, does this say so is this supposed to be something on the character's state that he's he's switching into some of this uh rhyming language in the end uh well we've got the rhyme at the end of the the the, the scene uh which is uh you know to, to to mark that it's the end of a scene uh that tends to happen uh, not always but it's uh, it's a thing i hadn't noticed uh much more rhyming in it um uh but i i, I may have missed things uh, other thoughts on that and other things elizabeth yeah, I wanted to say I really love the lines by Piston and Cryer. It says, for crying a little wench of 30 years old and upwards that had lost herself betwixt the tavern and the boardy house. And Cryer says, aye, that was a wench and this is gold. She was poor, but this is rich. And I just thought that was fantastic. I thought it was really sharp and to the point and just very, very kid. Mm. Yeah, it's it's that, that, that difference between this situation where I'm having to cry uh, for for nothing, and this situation where I know you're 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 touting for something that's valued, uh, that says an awful lot about things. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of calls on fortune. Fortune's not working in uh, Arasta's favour here, so fortune's influence is still strong, though shifting in a different direction. First, uh, first explicit call to death as well. Uh, Whether well, death's getting a bit of a look in here, um, Eric. Yeah, but like I mean, he won joust, so it's like I guess it depends how you look at fortune, kind of like uh, it, you know. It, he, but he lost the sort of love token, so I don't know. Also, uh, I just realized it says Carcanet in 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 his second speech, so we know that the possibly that the Carcanet uh, Ferdinando found is the one um, that um, Erastus has lost. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's all now quite neatly sewn together. Actually, that, that that those elements. Helen, has anybody looked up Carcanet? Do we know what it is? I'm looking it up now. I, um, I did. It's just like a jeweled colored neck necklace or something. Oh right, so it's not it's not a, a colored stone or anything. No, it, it's just the fashion of the chain. It, it seems to be a chain that's made up of lots of linked medallions rather than links like this and it can uh -huh. be worn like this 
as well as this. Right. Hmm. So I, I've been trying to, I, I, yeah, so I can't get a more specific definition than that. Size seems to have varied hugely as well as materials. But it's substantial. Yeah, but I mean, it's also, I've seen some images of it like this as a tiny little headband. Hmm. So you could wrap that around your wrist and it would disappear. Um, okay. Other, any other thoughts, um, on, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question about tone of, uh, the way it works. Cause you know, obviously we've got some good comedy business, but we've also got stuff that is perhaps, uh, designed to be played, uh, uh, with a straighter bat. Um, and, and the way it's all sort of flowing so far, uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just found it interesting. The whole like sort of that clowns always seem to either have, you know, lost their shoes or don't have enough for anything. I, I, I think I just thought it was like M Mother Bombie last week where they were just, the fiddlers were obsessed with shoes. Mm. Another thing. Well, he doesn't want to be wasting shoe leather wandering up and down to <laughs> quietly inquire whether anyone's found a valuable uh, chain. It's sort of this impossible. Find it without making it look like you're looking for it um you know this impossible task um and uh yeah um okay uh let's gather some more data about who uh where we are we we introduced to a number of additional uh characters some of whom have had a name check earlier so what we'll call scene four enter Solomon, haleb amarath and janissaries I long till Brusor be returned from Rome, to know how he hath borne him against the Christians that are assembled there to try their valour, but more to be well assured by him how Rhodes is fenced and how I best may lay my never failing siege to win that plot. For by the holy Alcoran I swear I'll call my soldiers home from Persia and let the Sophie breathe and from the Russian broils call home my hardy, dauntless janissaries, and from the other skirts of Christendom call home my bayshores and my men of war, and so beleaguer roads by sea and land, that key will serve to open all the gates, through which our passage cannot find a stop, till it have pricked the heart of Christendom, which now that paltry island keeps from scathe. Say, brother Amarath, and Caleb, say, what think you of our resolution? Great Solomon, heaven's only substitute, but earth's commander under Mohammed. So counsel I, as thou thyself hast said. Pardon me, dread sovereign, I hold it not. Good policy to call your forces home from Persia and Paulonia, bending them upon a paltry isle of small def defense. A common press of base, superfluous Turks may soon be levied for so slight a task. Ah, uh, Soliman, whose name hath shaped thy foes as withered leaves with autumn thrown down, fog not thy glory with so foul eclipse. Let not thy soldiers sound a base retire Till Persia stoop and thou be conqueror, what scandal were it thy to thy mightiness? After so many valiant Bashaws slain, whose blood hath been manured to their earth, whose bones hath made their deep ways passable, to sound a homeward dull and harsh retreat without a conquest or a mean revenge. Strive not for roads by letting Persia slip. The ones a lion also brought to death, whose skin will countervail the hunter's toil. The other is a wasp with threatening sting, whose honey is not worth the taking up. Why, Haleb, didst thou not hear our brother swear upon the Al Quran religiously that he would make an universal camp of he, all his scattered legions? And darest thou infer a reason why it is not meet? After his highness swears it shall be so, were it not thou art my father's son, and striking kindness wrestled not with ire, I would not hence till I let thee know what were to 
thwart a monarch's holy oath. Why, his highness gave me leave to speak my will, and far from flattery, I spoke my mind, and did discharge a faithful subject's love. Thou are Aristippus like, didst flatter him, not like my brother or a man of worth, and for his highness's vow I crossed it not, but gave my censure as his highness bade. Now for thy chastisement no, Amorath, I scorn them as a reckless lion scorns the humming of a gnat in summer's night. I take it, Haleb. Thou art friend to Rhodes. Not half so much as I am friend to Rhodes, as thou art enemy to thy sovereign. I charge thee, say wherein, or else by Mohammed, I'll hazard duty to thy in my sovereign's presence. Not for thy threats, but for myself I say, it is not meet that one so base as thou shouldst come about the person of a king. Must I give aim to this presumption? Your Highness knows I spake in duteous love. Your Highness knows I spake at your command, and to the purpose far from flattery. Thinks thou I flatter? Now I flatter not! And a rather important stage direction. Apologies for the slight pause <laughs> there. Uh, Amarath kills Halib. What dismal planet guides this fatal hour? Villain, thy brother's bones do call for thee. And Solomon then kills Amarath. <clears throat> to wander with them through eternal night. Oh, Solomon, for loving thee, I die. No, Amarath, for murdering him thou diest. O oh, Haleb, how shall I begin to mourn? Or how shall I begin to shed salt tears? For whom no words nor tears can well suffice. Ah, oh, that my rich imperial diadem could satisfy thy cruel destiny. Or that a thousand of our Turkish souls, or twenty thousand millions of our foes, could ransom thee from fell death's tyranny. To win thy life would Solomon be poor, and live in servile bondage all my days. A cursed Amorath, that for a worthless cause in blood hath shortened our sweet Haleb's days. Ah, oh, what is dearer bond than brotherhood? Yet, Amorath, thou wert my brother too. If willful folly did not blind my eyes, I, I, and thou as virtuous as Haleb, and I as dear to thee as unto Haleb, and thou as near to me as Haleb was. Ah, oh, Amorath, why wert thou so unkind to him for uttering but a thwarting word? And Haleb, why did not thy heart's counsel bridle the fond intemperance of thy tongue? Nay, wretched Solomon, why didst not thou withhold thy hand from heaping blood on blood? Might I not better spare one joy than both? If love of Haleb forced me on to wrath, cursed be that wrath that is the way to death. If justice forced me on, cursed be that justice that makes the brother butcher of his brother. Come, Janissaries, and help me to lament, and bear my joys on either side of me. I, late my joys, but now, lasting, now my lasting sorrow. Thus, thus, let Solomon pass on his way, bearing in his hand his heart's decay. And they exit, uh, end of scene. Uh, and thank you very much for tuning into this week's episode of Question Time, um, where, uh, yes, it, it, it went a bit far. Um, there's all sorts of questions to be thrown out by this. So, yeah, we got Halib who is basically questioning uh, foreign policy here. Uh, do we stay in Persia and continue doing our various wars elsewhere? Or do we turn on Rhodes? Rhodes, which is the setting of where everybody's been having a, a, a lovely uh, nuptial uh, jousting session. 
Uh, and Solomon's starting with this question of, well, uh, when Bruiser returns, who's gone to this particular session, hopefully he's going to come with some decent intelligence as to uh, how well the city's defended. We've been here before uh, in other plays as well. It raises all sorts of questions about uh, how this side is being portrayed. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the, the difference in language used by the, uh, the Turkish characters in this. There does seem to be a very different style to the way they're written um and yeah and then they get very murdery uh, and it's not um and it's all this domino murders we've only got three named characters on stage and only one of them walks away um so yeah uh, someone we've been putting in the chat scores for death uh had one name check in the previous uh, scene uh but now death has definitely got a two two uh, uh two goal difference now on uh, on some of the other uh, other uh, personifications of uh, of fates and things uh yeah thoughts in the room uh eric then rachel uh, I, I was thinking that uh, you know that sort of scene with the counselors in gorbaduk it would have been way more interesting if they had murders in it <laughs> But if then, it was set up like this, it would just be. <laughs> well, they did murder each other just just Later. after the meeting. You know, uh, it's so much easier to keep the minutes uh, if if you, you you wait for the murders to happen afterwards. Uh, Rachel. Um, I think that you know death shows up at the very beginning of this. We know things are going to happen along the way. Um. And I'm sure jousting is not without its casualties or, you know, its bloodshed. Um, but I think this scene, like, that we have, like, these counselors and this this king uh, come on, and all of a sudden two of them are dead very quickly. I think that's, um. I, I feel like if this was another play, this would be a, a, a scene that would have come later on um i think it's interesting that it comes on now it, it 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 i don't know is maybe a little ominous and foretelling as to what will come more that this might end or not end but at some point may be a very bloody play and not not be as comedic as as you know our first couple scenes in a you know, Basilisco and all all these clownish behavior has us think. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting mix of 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 you know uh, uh, plot and you know there's a love plot and there's there there may be complications there, but also we've got this wider geopolitical plot. Um, uh, the you know this this outside uh, potentially invading forces. Uh, the way they're portrayed here, uh, we have them talking about the the holy al quran uh we have uh calling on muhammad um and the way i say these, these characters being portrayed here uh which is quite different from the way the rest of the characters are being portrayed in the uh in uh, in the the scenes on roads so there's all sorts of um yeah really big questions about what this play is doing with the various different characters that they've got in play here eric I guess also it sort of sheds like Brewster's introduction completely differently. I mean, in a different light because it kind of, you know, it doesn't matter if he loses basically <laughs> um, because in the joust, because he's not there to actually, it's not his aim. Mm. Yeah, he doesn't care. I, I, and I think there's the, there is an interesting thing. He is, he's not interested in that. It's He's there by pretext and there's something... Uh, there, but then we have Solomon's response to the deaths here. Um, you know, admittedly, one of them is one he's actually uh, committed. But you know, it didn't have to be this way. Um, uh, quality to all of this. Um, you know, it's yeah. Uh, other thoughts. I'm trying not to impose too much thought on the room. Uh, Aliki. So I think it's interesting that. Uh, Solomon is is portrayed as a very thoughtful and kind of open-minded kind of person. Not only is he asking advice, he's he's sorry for the killing. I mean, he's sorry he killed somebody pretty much immediately afterwards, even before any like bad consequences other than the, the death are there. 
uh, I, I there's a lot of repetition of the name of the dead man, Haleb, 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 Haleb. That is, I thought, interesting. Because we don't need to know who he was, do we? <laughs> he's here for half a scene and then he's dead. Um, yeah, gonna... there might be a verbal dynamic just simply about the uh, sort of rhetorical flourishes going on in that speech as well. That you know, mm -hmm. very kiddie, as it were. Sorry, uh, I stepped over you. Uh, it's all right. And I'm just going to go back to what Eric was saying about how it puts a different spin on, um, I've forgotten the name of the other character, one who isn't, but Silisco. Uh, well, Br uh, Bruzor. Bruzor. Because it makes what I had seen as quite comic boasting on his side, not quite as comic as Basilisco's, but still fairly comic, um, quite sinister, actually. I'm here to spy on you. All that bit about um, making Christians swear loyalty to Muhammad is suddenly not just comedy foreigner. Hmm. Uh, Helen. Well, speaking as Bruce, it never occurred to me that he was anything but absolutely. Uh, he wasn't... He wasn't doing the chivalric flourishes. He was a man. He 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 was a man from the the the, the, the who had been brought up in the camp, had fought in all these wars, fought in all these battles. I thought he was the. He wasn't so much. He wasn't a per, He was a precursor of Basilisco, but he was he was what Basilisco was intending to be. A real warrior. Mm. Uh, we have a uh, closing uh, statements from the uh, Love, Fortune and Death, which we'll close this session with uh, before we go into final thoughts. So, um, uh, so uh, as we go back to the studio, uh, Love, Fortune and Death, uh, what, what's the match report so far? Now, death and fortune, which of all us three hath in the act of shown the greatest power? Have not I taught Erastus and Poseidon by mutual tokens to seal up their loves? Aye, but those tokens, the ring and the carcanet, were fortune gifts. Love, love gives no gold or jewels. Why, what is jewels or what is gold but earth? The new men knit together by compression. And by the world's bright eye, first brought to light, only to feed men's eyes with vain delight. Love's works are more of a mortal temper. I couple minds together by consent. Who gave Rhodes' princess to the Cyprian prince but love? Fortune that first by chance brought them together. For till by fortune persons meet each other, thou canst not teach their eyes to wound their hearts. But I made those knights of several sects and countries, each one by arms to honour his beloved. Nay, one alone to honour his beloved. The rest, by turning of my tickle wheel, came short in re reaching a fair honour's mark. I gave Erastus only that day's prize, a sweet renown, but mixed with bitter sorrow. For in conclusion of his happiness, I made him lose the precious carcanet, which whereupon depended all his hope and joy. More than so, for he that found the chain, even for that chain, shall be deprived of life. Besides, love hath enforced a fool, the fond bragado to presume to arms. Aye, but thou seest how he was overthrown by fortune's high displeasure. I am by death has been surprised, if fate had given me leave. I missed in him and in the rest I did accomplish on Haleb and Amirath, the worthy brethren, great Solomon but wherefore stay we let the sequel prove who is the greatest fortune, death or love and with that uh, last call by De death does have a, does like to have the <coughs> final word here, doesn't doesn't he, it's um, um and it's interesting. It's like he, he's going. You were you were faffing around with love chains, and who who scores the points with them? While I'm over here just killing loads of people. 
because uh, I'm death and I can do that. And it's it's there's there is a sense of he it looks like death just is going to win because he can just take everybody off the board. He's basically death. He's ultimately that that player of Monopoly who gets uh, uh, towards the end and just flips the board saying, no, don't want to play anymore and, and walks away. That's that's what death is um, is doing. Uh, I'm loving. I'm just wondering uh, what people know about these things. Uh, what is what is ju uh, jewels? Uh, but earth and human knit together by compression. That was just absolutely right. Um, and I'm I'm wondering how whether people knew that. I mean, I, uh, gold isn't made necessarily made by compression, but um, but jewels certainly are. Um, so that 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 really interests me because I just on a do people know that at this point in history um, or not? It's a, it's a really interesting question. Uh, unless I've just misread it totally, which is entirely possible. Uh, Alan, then Rachel. I have a feeling that that comes down from the, well, what we would call now scientists, but from the Greek um, philosophers, natural philosophers of, of the, the classical world. Hmm. Yeah, but I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested now as, as, as to, uh, yeah, how that, how that functions. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the kind of thing that turns up in Pliny, uh, regardless of whether he knew it was right or wrong. Uh, Rachel, then Helen. Um, uh, about love's thing there, I don't know if, you know, what is gold but earth? Because we have uh, Solomon here, uh, and wasn't there like that belief of Solomon's gold mind existing somewhere? Um and then uh, an humor, maybe it's supposed to be a play on unimol, you know, something like that. And, you know, compression and bright eye light and tempering. Maybe it's talking about the, you know, tempering of gold and, and metals and things like that. That, um, you know, love saying that I, I'm the one that brings it all together. You know, you might have the raw materials, but I'm the one who is the craftsman bringing all these things together. Yeah, it's 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 that that point difference between love and fortune. Just going, you know, uh, oh yeah, the baubles don't matter. It's it's all that matters is love. All you need is love. Um, uh, and then they're going, who? And yeah, they're just arguing over who scores the points about bringing these two people together. Was it I brought them together by acts? You see, by fortune brought them together you know oh yeah but i made them love each other and you know and and death just goes yeah i don't i can just kill everyone um you know and there we are uh helen yes i i was going to go back to jewels um i always feel early modern jewelry was it was it was sort of crystallized fruit and I don't mean crystallized fruit made done with sugar. I don't mean like the stuff you get in a box at Christmas. I mean, they were made, the, the, the rubies and emeralds and things, they're all treated as if they're fr the fruit of the earth, but made into, made hard and into rocks. And so this, this is a completely different way of looking at it. Hmm. Mm. I like that. Uh, are there thoughts about this particular closing moment of this act? Uh, they're setting up the next act. Uh, you know, more to come, folks, in episode two, um, uh, which I, I quite like. Um, so, yeah, we've got Fortune and Love. They're fighting over one point and Death's already scored two. So I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not liking the odds here. I'm not liking the odds. Um, any other thoughts on this scene? OK, as we move towards extra time, the question of final thoughts on the play itself. It's not unproblematic. It, uh, there are lots of representation issues, uh, which I think in performance can probably be solved. Um, but uh, they're there. Uh, we've got a lot of you know, dramatic material. We've got good comedy material. Structurally, it feels really sound. Um, and it's been quite enjoyable so far, but uh, I don't know what the room thinks. Uh, Emma, do you have any final thoughts on the play so far? Thoughts on characters? Thoughts on on uh, on on actions? Any thoughts at all? Yeah, 
yeah, things that stood out to me, um, the trio Love, Fortune and Death are, are great. And I, I think you can have so much fun kind of deciding what you want to do with them and how integrated into the whole play they are. Um, do they come on and off or are they always present either on stage at the side or maybe even in the audience or somewhere, given that kind of omnipresent feel? Um, and do they silently get involved in scenes or not? There's loads of decisions to be made. Um, decisions on how you play them as well. Do you play them very human? just kind of having a very human kind of rivalry or do you make them more weird and wacky? I just think there's so many fun choices there. Mm. I, I, for some reason, I just see death sitting in a corner roll, roll, rolling up a, a cigarette. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just, 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 very, just always sitting there, not really paying attention to the action, just going, yeah, it's all right, they'll die in a minute. Uh, you know, I'll just hand out death and destruction one, one, one fag at a time. Uh, uh, Zoe, any uh, final thoughts from you? Um... Um, kind of riffing off off that, I kind of started to write down a few kind of for each scene, like who I think kind of won won it with kind of love, and then into death, and then into fortune. So so yeah, kind of like a, oh, this is my scene. Watch me watch me show you how I won this one. Uh, kind of controlling controlling the stuff. I right? kind of like the idea. Um, there we go. That's my little mini thought. <laughs> Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, that that question of you know, are they doubled or do we keep them separate from the rest of the cast? Are they on? Are they interfering in a sort of more physical way with what's going on on stage? Um, and yeah, and uh, and and how, whether they're they're there to help? You know, I, it's that thing of when when they start handing knives to people at specific moments. You know, you know, or or, or, or tokens, or or if uh, you know, it'd be quite nice to see Fortune just just quietly knocking the jewel out of his hand uh, so that it gets dropped uh, during a bit of business on stage, so that it gets picked up on stage rather than it being action that happens off stage. That kind of thing. So yeah, really liking that as a thought. Uh, Aliki, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure yet. I, I'm slightly, I'm slightly put off by the whole existence of Solomon and him being in the title and so on, and I'm dreading further spectacularly ignorant and kind of unpleasant characterizations of Islam and Muslim monarchs. But other than that, I'm having a really great time so far. <laughs> so we'll see where it takes us. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think that match, matches my thoughts. You know, it, it, it's bouncing along really nicely. It's very well structured, but just going, oh, where is this bit going? What what is the What are the actual real world implications of what? what these scenes are doing uh, and can that be solved in performance or uh, without necessarily making any structural changes or just by uh, addressing how you work it in the room um, and, and present it for the audience. Uh, Alan, any final thoughts? I mean, it, it seems to have fewer explicit problems than many that we've looked at lately. Um, yes, we've had rather too much <laughs> of problems of late, yeah. as we said. Uh, I think there are some issues in the scene we just did with the uh, Turkish court, which would require a bit of care where people are swearing by the prophet and referring to the Quran, which I think with modern sensitivities could cause some issues. Um, the only other thought I'd got was on the characterization line. Noah Leakey was beginning to suggest that Piston was actually a, a child. I actually see him as more being a small adult, someone of maybe jockey type proportions. So possibly contemporary with or slightly older than um, the guy to whom he's serving. Uh, but not a child. He's, he's referred to as a page at one point. I don't know whether there's a, a technical definition of or, or a, a placement for pages uh, in terms of ages. The, uh, the, the image that was going through my mind was the picture of the Spanish court and their um, their love of dwarves. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's it's the it's the question of whether whether uh, I say there's a specific age range or or, or a function for for pages. Is is there, is there anything set or is it just a generic term that that gets a bit washy around the edges? Second. 
Second. Excellent. I, um, I don't know. I've, no. I've never a, had a page. <laughs> no, I've no. often wanted one. The impression of pages is younger, generally, uh, in my mind, because uh, you just you think of page boy. Uh, but that's, you know, it's not necessarily a wedding. Uh, Aliki, did you want to leap, leap, leap in on that? Or, um... Not on that so much as I've been hunting down which Suleiman we might be talking about. And I can't, I'm, I noticed that Suleiman the Magnificent conquered the island of Rhodes. So uh, I am suspecting that that's who we've got. Yeah, the, the, the spoilers, people. Spoilers. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Eric, uh, final thoughts? Yeah, I'm I, like, I mean, obviously, we've talked about, you know, what it's doing, but uh, I feel like I'm interested in finding out more because this is quite a cliffhanger with all the setups that have been sort of created, set up, a setup that has been set up. That sounds a bit weird. But yeah. yeah, that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> Fair enough. That's cool. Um, uh, Elizabeth, any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah, just very briefly, I think most of the things that I saw about the text have been said. What I love about it is the way it's structured. I love that we come back to love, death and fortune at the end of Act One, just the same way we started the play with them. I really like that. And I also like the transition between each of the scenes, even though they're not labelled as such, because I find that they really build the character development through the play, it really, really builds. You get a strong sense of who Poseida is, a strong sense of who Basilico is. I think there's a, a lot of lovely characters in this that really come to light. And I do think this deserves a plan of a place of honour, this play, so far, with the Turkish plays we've already done. Because it's quite a good one. Um, we even have the killing of... Um, of one of the characters towards the towards quite close to the mid to the middle of Act One, which I was surprised at because usually those killings come a bit later. But we had two deaths, Amaras and another character, I can't remember his name, um, in the first act. So I thought that was quite cool. And I liked the way um it was discussed. Like he shouldn't have said that to 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 gain Amaras anger. But he did, and so that he so he's dead, um, and and uh, so I'm enjoying it a lot. I think it goes with a lot of the Turkish plays we've done, and I think it's quite compelling. So I'm enjoying it a lot. Mm, there's a really interesting question about what, uh, how interlinked these, uh, you know, because we talked about history plays and the, the various history plays, uh, English history plays, uh, and how they sort of overlap and talk to each other and um, but don't quite necessarily match. Um, the question of what's this doing with a, uh, a wider history and those other uh, Turk plays that we've done, uh, you know, and, and yes, in the sense that it's, uh, it's, it's so far a much more structurally successful and more satisfying play than, say, um, uh, Selimus, which uh, you know we 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 went with for a reasonable percentage of the time, and then sort of really turned off uh, uh, in the final session. Um, so yeah, it's it's playing with all of those those uh, questions and issues uh, that uh, hopefully we'll be able to tie together sometime in the future. Not probably for a while, but um, uh, definitely it's part of that conversation that we're trying to build. Thoughts uh, from the viewers at home, if you have any uh, suggestions, thoughts, or comments uh, about this play, and or for that matter, any of the other co plays that this is talking with. It's it's talking with so many different plays. Uh, both in its framing device of having this returning uh, gods, fate uh, characters, uh, of which we've had in so many plays recently. Uh, but also, yes, I've, I, I've just remembered Helen. You're absolutely right, um, and um, and and so many other things. So it's uh, there. There are lots and lots of other plays that are doing similar things to this around about the same time. Uh, and yes, I did forget to go to Helen. I will now go to Helen. Helen, any final thoughts? <laughs> yeah, the one thing that I was thinking in the last scene was that the the contemporary audience would be saying to each other sagely how different how very different from the Privy Council of our own dear Queen. <laughs> um, Not. 
<laughs> well, yes, yes, I mean, they, they tended not to murder each other actually in the presence. Mm. But, um, but the thing that arrested me about this play is that normally when you get um, characters, mythological or, or representative characters who are form an introduction or who pop up at various points, I immediately look for to make sure that one can cut them because I tend not nowadays, I tend to prefer the narrative to various strange um, presentations of, of, of whatever's death. Um, but here, in fact, they add something, mm. uh, I, which is, in my experience, unusual that they they really do. I, I I mean, I thought, was it truth and error, or I forget who it was in uh, in, in previous plays. Uh, well, uh, Musidorus, isn't it? That's yeah. uh, it's envy and um, envy. Yes, and, uh, I didn't yeah. think they added anything. To mm. be brutally frank. This is much more engaging with the with the question yeah. and the issue. Uh, yeah. It's doing very nicely. The only real problem with a chorus like this is that if they turn up every single act, then the audience can start timing the show based on it, uh, and that's not a good psychological approach, uh, which we should uh, we should resist. Uh, Rachel, final thoughts, and then uh, Lois has joined us uh, from who's been watching uh, in the background. So hopefully Lois will say something as well. But I'll go to Rachel first. Um, the chorus that. I feel like this today that this play has gone by very fast. It does not feel like the amount of time that has passed has actually passed because there's something about the way that this is paced that it's not moving so fast, but it's not dragging itself. It's doing what it has to do, and it has these little you know scenes like with Basilico um, or Basilisco that are, um, you know, funny, but I feel, I feel like this play is doing this thing where, um, so far where it's, it's, it's like a good time. Like people are it, like in little women where they go ice skating and then it turns out they're skating on thin ice and it feels like there's some undercurrent of danger, like how, um, the bringing up of that privy council, like that on the surface, things are jovial but all these people want such different things and they'll do whatever it is to get them. And we don't know how far they'll go yet. And um, about Solomon and his court, I think even with the, I think there's, there are problematic things in the way that people in this period are portraying anybody who isn't white, but um, I still think they're very compelling characters. There's something about that scene and there's something about the way that he's written uh, Solomon that is 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 very interesting. Um, and I wonder if, if for some of these characters that, uh, for, I mean, in this case, you know, because we do see so many um, insulting portrayals of people of color in this, in, in this time period that, you know, we'll always have complex feelings as to how somebody's portrayed because we're waiting for the, the you know the shoe to drop but I, I i don't know i think i think this is a very complex character and i'm interested in him regardless of if the playwright you know it means something about this to be insulting mm, excellent thoughts uh lois uh welcome welcome to the room uh Ed, do you have any thoughts uh, about the play so far yeah, i really enjoyed listening to this i i've read this play and uh, i'm quite interested in it i mean uh, there's quite a lot of scholarly interest in kid at the moment for various reasons and uh, uh, i was interested in the relation to the spanish tragedy which also has characters who appear at the beginning and end of scenes and who also do kind of carry on the action because you know it's the ghost of andrea who wants to see his death revenged, and then there's revenge, a personification. 
And then at the end of each act, you get Andrea saying, nothing's happening yet. Why am I not getting revenge? Things are going really badly. And revenge keeps saying, just wait, just wait. We'll, we'll kill everybody off eventually. And he certainly does. And, and then there's a final bit where he even gives Andrea a chance to decide where exactly in the underworld to place every one of the people that have just died. Uh, so it, it does actually have the same sort of progression, I think, that we get here. You know, I think it's uh, uh, the style is in some ways very like Kid, but it's actually a bit less mannered, I think, than the Spanish tragedy, which has some really quite amazing rhetorical speeches. I mean, um, I don't know if anybody remembers, but the O oh, eyes, no eyes, but fountains fraught with tears. It's just incredible the way the, the the words in that keep getting reused and finally are all kind of jumped together in a certain order at the, the very end. And there's nothing like that, well, so far anyway, here which makes me wonder which one is first. You know, people have always assumed that the Spanish tragedy must be later because it uses Solomon and Perseida in a kind of almost cartoon version right at the end. But it could be that he decided after having done that, or maybe while he was thinking about writing Solomon and Perseida and used it in the Spanish tragedy, maybe he then decided to uh, to show how it should be done. I don't know. Mm. Yes, it, and it, it, that, that question does... Uh, uh, place our, the, our problems with precisely where do we date uh, something like this it doesn't get printed uh, for another few years uh, after the, uh, the the Spanish tragedy uh, so we don't know precisely where it lives uh, in terms of when it was created so um, we can you can argue it either way probably um, and it's not essential to us as a room yeah. Uh, but yeah the, the similarities between the two and the differences are, are quite striking even thinking how far back it was when we read that I don't know how many people in this room were there actually uh, I think the room has turned and 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 swapped um, uh, readers uh, many times since then, as it is not nearly a year ago uh, since we first read the Spanish tragedy <laughs> in this room. So uh, long overdue a return. Um, so yeah, I, and um, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I, I wasn't sure what we were going to get out of this, and so far I'm very, very happy uh, with the results we have got so far. Um, that maybe this first act has moved uh, really quickly for us, but uh, in part because we're doing slightly less text today than we would normally schedule, uh, only slightly less, um, just for neatness sake. Uh, it seemed sensible to try and make sure we maintain the unity of acts uh, for over the next uh, sessions. Uh, so uh, next time we'll be joining Act 2 and Act 3, and then after that Act 4 and Act 5 as we uh, try and complete this text. All that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers in the room for all their, their wonderful work and additional commentary from our lurk lurking team too. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Bye. Ah. An humour knit together by compression. Mm-hmm.